morning, everyone. Um, hope you don't mind. I'm a little under the weather, so I'll read a little bit as well as uh, walk you through this. Um, a little bit like a bad rash, my PhD uh, research has come back to haunt me over and over again. So I'm going to bring you through uh, some of the experiences uh, this research has had after I've given it up to, uh, to the community. Um, just on a quick note, the uh, Longhouse VR was part of a multi-year PhD project uh, researching the notions of virtual archaeology, knowledge construction, and meaning making at the digital level. Using existing cultural, historical, archaeological material, known archaeological site information, and historical text, the 3D CGI uh, Longhouse was constructed uh, within 3D space. What was generally, essentially made real was the writings, field reports, and guesses and accumulated hundred years of archaeological longhouse construction assumptions. The visual reference guide of theoretical approaches, which due to procedural nature of 3D model construction, could be mixed and mingled. However, the intended use of this particular research was for archaeologists to actually go back and take a look at their research from a, a visual perspective. So basically, I was taking their theoretical approaches, I was making real or visualizing uh, their assumptions within that space. The um, important thing with regards to this process was that um, because it was VR and because it was a single person experience, um, I as the guide was with the individuals at all times. I was there to uh, point out specific areas of interest was able to point out their particular uh, areas of uh, research and uh, if they were getting, going to get uh, tripped up with the, uh, the tether or the VR because they were wandering around in uh, physical space, I was there to make sure that they didn't fall and hurt themselves. Now due to uh, last minute changes in the hardware used for the VR experience, um, we actually had a, uh, an issue with the technology, the way that it was presented. So um, the pristine game-like environment that we had originally designed for the, ocular, uh, for the Oculus Rift, uh, we instead got a orange uh, uh, environment for the HTC Vive. And subsequently, um, from my perspective, uh, we failed at being able to deliver a visual, uh, in, visually engaging uh, archaeological environment. Um, however, my users didn't, uh, couldn't give a rat's ass, actually. Um, and they, uh, as soon as they put on the, uh, the VR headset, uh, they started to immediately engage with the space. Now, um, throughout that process, um, I was working with the Museum of Ontario Archaeology. In Canada, uh, we obviously deal with a lot of archaeology that's unseen. Uh, we're having to actually reconstruct uh, our notions of what the uh, Indigenous cultures were like pre-contact and even after contact. So we're constantly uh, constructing knowledge with material that we don't have. Uh, with the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, uh, there are parochial uh, a uh, smaller museum, but very important within the indigenous archaeological field uh, in Canada. And they uh, provided a lot of support uh, during, uh, during my research time. Uh, they decided after the, the uh, PhD research was done uh, that they would uh, take the VR experience and uh, repurpose it for an exhibit. Um, obviously, because they uh, supported the project, I uh, I, and it was open source. I said, sure, go right ahead. And they deployed it on January 12, 2017. Um, too much fanfare. Um, but first, let's just talk about where they deployed it. And it was interesting because uh, the museum is uh, 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 small, but uh, very mighty in terms of its colonial approaches to a, an archaeological experience. Um, it had been around uh, primarily for about 30 years. I actually went to it when I was a, uh, uh, in public school and uh, inspired me, obviously, to become an archaeologist. Um, but this particular uh, area here, this is the jury room. Uh, this is your typical uh, colonial vision of what an archaeologist would do. 
uh, you know, what his environment would look like in the time he spent, uh, uh, you know, working within the space. Sorry, I'll go back to there. Um, they decided to actually repurpose that space and turn it into the VR experience, which I thought was kind of interesting because now it was um, instead of uh, sort of archaeologically uh, framed, it was now indigenously uh, framed. So the um, the space, and primarily because the space was uh, enclosed, it allowed for the VR to uh, it, uh, to be properly deployed and so forth. Now, um, the day of the uh, the exhibit, um, we had an inaugural opening, and the uh, seventy plus year old retired school teacher wandered in during the uh, uh, the press, and uh, she was completely unaware of what was going on and. Uh, when we asked if anybody would like to uh, try it out for the first time. She was the first uh, first person to volunteer, which I was quite grateful for. And um, she basically got the sense of what the archaeologists were viewing. And now I have to keep uh, repeating this, that this particular VR experience was an archaeologist-led uh, uh, experience. So I had no concerns whatsoever for the public to be engaged with this. It was just the way that the museum had wanted to uh, um, put it through. So from this moment on, uh, we've had uh, over 1,500 visitors over two and a half years, uh, school uh, children, politicians over on the side, uh, community members and the indigenous communities surrounding London. Um, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology has a massive uh, powwow every year, and subsequently we get a lot of community involvement uh, getting involved. Now, uh, one of the problems was that uh, because it was primarily for archaeolog archaeologists to introspectively <laughs> examine the way I had visually interpreted their personal research, it was at best a technology experience for the general public to test out uh, as there wasn't really uh, for people, uh, there wasn't really anything for people to uh, interact with. The uh, Oculus Story Studio uh, group they coined a term called the Swayze effect. And uh, basically it's Patrick Swayze and Ghost. Uh, as you know, you know, he's dead. He wants to interact with his wife, but he can't. So he can occupy the space, but he can't affect change within the space. The Oculus uh, Story Studio uh, guys, when they uh, were developing the Oculus Rift, they basically were saying the same thing. If you're going to provide a VR experience, make sure people can actually uh, do something about it. Uh, as such, the uh, museum staff decided to rework my original game. Um, again, it's open source. They paid for it. Why not? And uh, they developed a, 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 a flaming arrow uh, experience. Uh, here we see on the, uh, the right-hand side. Notice it's a compound bow. That was probably the only model that was available for, uh, using uh, uh, Unity at the time. And uh, so... The participants could now uh, test out their skills, uh, archery skills, by uh, by shooting a flaming arrow. Um, some of the comments that, and we've been uh, over the the two and a half years. I had asked the one request I had asked was, please interview the people uh, before they go in and after they uh, get out of the experience. It's generally five minutes for a two dollar uh, experience. So the museum was kind of using this as a technology introduction uh, and hopefully they were going to gain a little bit of uh, exposure to Indigenous uh, uh, history. And these were some of the uh, initial uh, comments. I really like me and Granny both enjoyed the experience. Um, so we were starting to get some qualitative uh, uh, comments which clearly demonstrated that people were taking the time to think about it. Um, we also got some very interesting comments here. Uh, more flaming arrows. Uh, it was blurry. So as soon as I, I saw that comment, I knew that the individual uh, experiencing the VR uh, environment had a ocular issue, i.e. speed up. Okay, got it. So anyways, lots of, lots of stuff. <laughs> so what did we learn? Well, uh, we learned that the visitors were mostly drawn uh, to the technology itself, 
But once they engage with the technology and once they engage with the uh, content, they were starting to get a, a good understanding of potentially what we want to convey. Um, there was a phenomenological shift when people entered into the physical space and donned the VR goggles. The more visual and oral and oral factory clues to help them trigger and engage with the space greatly enhanced their digital uh, aura. Um, this experience actually uh, drove us to start thinking about how we're going, how we would engage with the physical space and make sure make it a little bit more tactile as well as enclose the space to uh, create more smells. So we started experimenting with a, a couple of different design patterns. And uh, this particular design here is the one that we're now going to deploy at the Whitchurch uh, Stovall Museum, which is the site of the uh, massive mantle site. It was uh, one of North America's largest uh, Iroquois uh, coalesced uh, village sites, over uh, 2,000 people and 100 longhouses. In this particular environment, uh, you'll see on the right-hand side, this, uh, this new enclosure will be put into this space and we tend to use uh, more tactile environments and in infuse it with uh, smells and, uh, and more sounds. The one problem that we have with that particular, well, one problem we have with that site is it's very small and the, uh, uh, sometimes the smells will overcome every, the smells that we're going to deploy are going to overcome it. And uh, one last thing, um, as part of this process, uh, obviously I was not happy with my, uh, what was delivered from a PhD perspective. Um, so I thought, okay, what's the best way to get this rapidly uh, redeveloped? Why not go to Ubisoft and ask them for help? And uh, they were very, uh, very keen on making sure that we were able to access their material as well. So we're currently in discussions about actually stripping out the uh, Mohawk uh, village sequence in Assassin's Creed 3, which is a legacy product. Um, but part of the problem that we have in this particular case is that this product was designed for a completely different requirement. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to give the users the opportunity to experience both the Ubisoft version, as well as the archaeologist uh, version as well. So the final thoughts really are is, um, and I'm not sure if anybody's read this book to their kids, uh, don't let the pigeon drive the bus. Um, so in this particular case, the museums were, uh, the museum and the uh, people engaged in the museum, the communities and so forth, they were effectively driving the user engagement after I gave the material over to them. However, they've provided new information to allow us to uh, re-engage uh, new communities and be able to uh, develop a more intense, less uh, uh, Patrick Swayze experience. Thank you.